At the beginning of every service, we light a flaming chalice. Our chalice lighting words today are by the Reverend Maureen Killeran, entitled, We Are the Magic of Star Stuff. Be with us. Deepen our willingness to live without certainty, to take the risks of living on the edges of our creativity, to step beyond the boundaries of possibility and hope. Help us always to remember that we are in our essence, the magic of star stuff, that we are kin to all that is and was and may yet come to be. For all those things we dare to hope and dream, we kindle our chalice flame this day. Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this, the first Sunday morning of July. My name is Mary Kay Stilwell. I'm a worship associate here at the church. On the chancel with me, by way of Laramie, Wyoming, is Jamie Radcliffe, who will be attending the service with me this morning. Oscar Rios is our guest musician, and a special welcome to you. Thank you for joining us. And welcome to everyone. Now that we're together, well, we're together. A lot of us are together this morning. That's nice to see. The last couple years, uh, we've been on Zoom, we've been live streaming, and slowly we're coming back together in church. Um, however we come together, it's a chance to deepen our, con our connection with the sources of meaning in our lives and to proclaim who we are and what we're about. We throw open our doors and proclaim the radical love and welcome that is at the heart of our faith. Our congregation aspires to be a loving anti-racist community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and our world. This is at the heart of our covenant that we pass as we come through our door every time we come into the church building. Ours is a really big vision, and we know that creating a loving community begins with welcome. As Desmond Tutu reminds us, we are made to tell the world that there are no outsiders. All are welcome here. So whether this is your first time or your 500th time, if you came here hopeful or heartbroken, whether in person or watching live stream, Whatever your age, your gender, your skin color, whomever you love, you are welcome here. Let us join together in love. And as we enter into worship, whether you're in the sanctuary or the sanctuary of your own home, let's take a moment to center ourselves in, in our place, wherever we are, to take a few deep breaths, find a comfortable place in our body, and let us begin. So rise uh, in body and or spirit for our opening hymn, Do You Hear, that I hope is up here.
it's time for all ages, so I invite any the children or the older children who want to come forward for the story, please do. Our story today is Jingle Dancer by Cynthia Latich Smith, illustrated by Cornelius Van Wright and Ying Hua Hu. Tink, 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 tink sang cone-shaped jingles sewn to Grandma Wolf's dress. Every Grandma bounce step brought clattering tinks as light blurred silver against jingles of tin. Jenna daydreamed at the kitchen table tasting honey on fry bread, her heart beating to brum, 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 brum of the powwow drum. As moon kissed sun goodnight, Jenna shifted her head on Grandma Wolf's shoulder. I want to jingle dance too. Next powwow, you could dance girls, Grandma Wolf answered, but we don't have enough time to mail order tins for rolling jingles. Again and again, Jenna watched a videotape of Grandma Wolf jingle dancing. When Grandma bounce-stepped on TV, Jenna bounce-stepped on family room carpet. But Jenna's dress would not be able to sing. It needed four rows of jingles. As sun fetched morning, Jenna danced east to Great Aunt Sissa's porch. Jenna's bounce steps crunched autumn leaves, but her steps didn't jingle. Once again, Great Aunt Sis told Jenna a Muskegee Creek story about Bat. Although other animals had said he was too small to make a difference, Bat won a ball game by flying high and catching a ball in his teeth. Rising sunlight reached through the window pane and flashed against, what was it, hanging in Aunt Sissa's bedroom? Jingles on a dress too long quiet. May I borrow enough jingles to make a row, Jenna asked, not wanting to take so many that Aunt Sissa's dress would lose its voice. You may. Aunt Sis answered, rubbing her calves. My legs don't work so good anymore. Will you dance for me? I will, said Jenna, with a kiss on Aunt Sis's cheek. Now, Jenna's dress needed three more rows. As sun arrived at mid-circle, Jenna skipped south to Mrs. Scott's brand new duplex. At Jenna's side, Jingles clink. Mrs. Scott led Jenna into the kitchen. Once again, Jenna rolled a dough and Mrs. Scott fried it. May I borrow enough jingles to make a row? Jenna asked, not wanting to take so many that Mrs. Scott's dress would lose its voice. You may, Mrs. Scott answered, tossing flour with her apron. At powwow, I'll be busy selling fry bread and Indian tacos. Will you dance for me? I will, said Jenna with a high five. Now Jenna's dress needed two more rows. As sun caught a glimpse of moon, Jenna strolled west to Cousin Elizabeth's apartment. At Jenna's side, jingles clanked. Elizabeth had arrived home late from the law firm. Once again, Jenna helped Elizabeth carry her files. May I borrow enough jingles to make a row? Jenna asked, not wanting to take so many that Elizabeth's voice would Elizabeth's dress would lose its voice. You may, Elizabeth answered, borrowing through her messy closet for her jingle dress. This weekend I'm working on a big case and can't go to powwow. Will you dance for me? I will, said Jenna, clasping her cousin's hands. Now, Jenna's dress needed one more row of jingles, but she didn't know which way to turn. As moon glowed pale, Jenna shuffled north to Grandma Wolf's. 
At Jenna's side, Jingle sat silent. High above, clouds wavered like worried ghosts. When Jenna tugged open the door, Jingle sang, tink, 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 tink. Grandma Wolf was jingle dancing on TV. Jenna breathed in every ho, ah, ho, oh of a powwow song. Her heart beat brum, 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 brum to the pounding of the drum. On family room carpet, beaded moccasins waited for Jenna's feet. She shucked off a sneaker and slipped on a moccasin that long before had danced with Grandma Wolf. Jenna knew where to find her fourth row. May I borrow enough jingles to make a row? Jenna asked, not wanting to take so many that Grandma Wolf's dress would lose its voice. You may, Grandma said with a hug. Now Jenna's dress could sing. Every night that week, Jenna helped Grandma Wolf sew on jingles and bring together the dance regalia. Every night, Jenna practiced her bounce steps. Brum, 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 sounded the drum at the powwow the next weekend. As light blurred silver, Jenna jingle danced. For great aunt Sis, whose legs ache. For Mrs. Scott, who sold fry bread. For Elizabeth, who worked on her big case. And for Grandma Wolf, who warmed like the sun. Tink, 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 tink. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, as the children go back to their classroom or to their seats, will you join me in singing the oneness of everything? Please rise in spirit or in person. Sing out strong, be bold. This is an unfamiliar one. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't done this in a while or ever. Um, I'm getting away from the mic. <laughs> I could play it clear through once for you. Okay. Bueno. Because we're just going to use the intro.
this is a case of the words are really great and the music is wonderful. And I thought we'd sung it before, but I must have been listening to YouTube sometime. But thank you. That was wonderful. It really was. So now we turn to joys and sorrows. Uh, each Sunday when we gather together, we take a moment to share our joys and sorrows, our, the highlights and concerns of our lives. This is a central part of our service, a way of sharing, and also a way of deepening our relationship with others. A caring community lightens our burdens and brightens our joys. Uh, Bob's going to help me out here. As the music plays, I invite you to say aloud or type into the chat your name or the name of another you wish to be remembered, either in sorrow or concern. And Bob will read those on the chat. Claire. Pardon me? Patsy. And Katya both have COVID. Jackie? John Fink, who I know is holding his brother, tested positive for COVID yesterday. And his, Joanna's older brother, what's his name? John. John. Don. Don. All the veterans are all good. All the veterans? I didn't catch the last part. All the veterans all the veterans that are not with us. Leslie. Leslie. People of Ukraine. People of Ukraine. Sharon T's family. Sharon T's family. Jean. Jean's family. Marie. Marie. Bob, do you have something to add? Trey. Trey. Craig. Craig. From the chat from Judy Magnuson, my niece, Maylisha, who lost her beloved pet dog this week. From Becky Sate, the family of Nancy Kopischke, I hope I pronounced that right, who died on Thursday. I now invite you to say aloud or type into the chat your name or the name of another you wish to be remembered in joy. Happy anniversary to Jean and Gail. Happy anniversary to Jean and Gail. And all the veterans who are with us. And there was another over here. The song is over. Yay. Nice to see Kathy here today. Yes, nice to see Kathy here today. Happy Joy. anniversary to my grandson, Jason. Ooh, happy anniversary to your grandson's. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Twins, right? Uh -huh. Joy for the beginning of our um, summer indigenous program. Joy for the beginning of our summer indigenous program. I'll second that. Bob, do you have some joy to share? From the chat, Jeanette Nakata just says, Melissa. Marilyn Harker says, happy birthday to Leonard. Christine Davis says, joy to all who will join us for the Roots of Injustice, Seeds of Change this afternoon. And I don't know if it's a joy, but I really enjoyed you all singing that last piece. <laughs> Some sorrows and joys are held so close to our hearts that 
they may not be ready to be shared aloud. So let's take a moment of silence to honor these. May we remember those who spoke there, here, those who wrote in the chat, and those we hold in our hearts in silence. Thank you. Each week we take up a collection to support the work of this church and our partners in the community. We do this because just as we all grow from our participation in this community, we all give back through our time, our talent, and our treasure. To give, uh, you can text UC Lincoln and the amount to 73256. That's UCL Lincoln, and the amount to 73256. The offering will now be gratefully received.
check, check. I'm not sure if this is working, but can I share a joke with you? Families came, a diverse group of um, Latino, Latina, Latinx, and uh, other ethnic groups, including white American neighbors, came together with their children, grandparents, neighbors, aunts, uncles. It was a full house. We had a great time. I talked about the instruments, the history of the instruments, the way I feel when I play these instruments. So I, I left, came back home the next morning, I received a text message from a gentleman, and I'm going to read it because it means a lot to me. Good morning, Oscar. So your story in the Grand Island Independent this morning. Apparently there was an interview, which I don't remember, but it <laughs> happened. It happened sometime there. My father was a UNL professor who spent quite a bit of time in Argentina and Chile. He was a musician himself and always intrigued about the Inca instruments. He brought back charangos that he played frequently. He learned how to play those instruments and I inherited them. He passed away a while, a while back. Dad would love it if it would be shared with someone with the passion that you have. So he so this is, he brought two amazing instruments. He came with his wife all the way to Lincoln. He lives an hour away from Grand Island. I, and I don't remember the, time, the, the little town in, in which he lived, they lived. So they came to Lincoln and they brought this beautiful armadillo charango, which no longer can be found or bought. Or bought because this instrument is no longer made because of the fact that this particular little armadillo, or kirkincho, as they call it in South America, is in danger of extinction. But here it is, he brought two of them, and his father played this, and he says, you know, Oscar and his wife, they both gave it to me, and, and, and I was like, what is this? <laughs> does, I mean, does that make sense? Here I am, someone reached out to me, heard me play, and now they are giving me something unique and special. So today, I want to thank them wherever they are. Uh, his name is John Wayne, and <laughs> yes, right, yes, right, and, and his father, W.J. Wayne. So wherever you are, <laughs> know that we are going to Celebrate this moment. Thank you. Thank you. Oscar, thanks for being with us. Our reading today is called The Birthday of the World, an Oto Missouri creation story. Today, there are seven surviving clans in the tribe. These are the bear, beaver, elk, eagle, buffalo, pigeon, and owl. The story that follows is one of many versions that describe the origin of these clans. Nothing existed at the beginning except an abundance of water. It flowed everywhere, eventually pushing all life out of it. In time, the water receded and land surfaced. Vegetation sprouted. Forests reached towering heights. In the recesses of these forests, animals and birds dwelt. All life spoke the same language. From the life-giving waters, the bear clan rose and came ashore. They peered about the dry world and thought that they were the first people here, but they were quickly disappointed when they came upon the tracks of others, which were embedded in the soft mud, leading out and away from the water. Following these signs, the bear clan chased the beaver clan, whom they eventually caught. The beaver clan, a diplomatic people, 
suggested that the clans became brothers and lived together in harmony because alone life was so hard. The intent of the bear clan was to kill the beaver clan when they found them, but the bears were soon pacified by their new kin and resigned themselves to the fact that they were not the first people. So the bear and beaver clans kept each other company and were companions at the beginning. Some time passed before the bear and beaver clans met other peoples, and the two were content to think no others existed. Then it happened. The bear and the beaver clans came upon the elks, whom they desired to kill. But instead, the elks proposed that they be allowed to accompany the two clans. After a time, the bear and beaver clans had a change of heart and agreed that all could be brothers and help one another. Now, the sky people came through the sky opening and swooped down to earth, where they found evidence of three other clans. The eagles knew that there were more people in the other three clans than in the eagles. The eagles approached these clans, and once more, the clans grew. Having decided to live together, they began sharing among themselves certain things and knowledge that had before belonged solely to individual clans, but it was now used to help all of the clans. In order to learn how to live, the clans called upon Wakanda, the creator. Wakanda taught each clan certain things and gave each group certain sacred knowledge and therefore rights associated with a sacred pipe that was also a gift from Wakanda. In this manner of the sacred pipe, the four clans live. In time, the bear, beaver, elk, and eagle clans met the buffalo head, snake, owl, and pigeon clans. The last two, like the eagles, were from the sky. The buffalo head, renamed buffalo, owl, pigeon, and snake, now extinct, had their own people, and this sacred possession they offered to the bear, beaver, elk, and eagle clans. At first, this gesture was ignored by the bears and the pipe rejected, but the bears softened. And finally, bear, beaver, elk, and eagle clans accepted the pipe, which was an offering of friendship and coexistence. They reciprocated, making a similar gesture of friendship. So it was in these acts that everything began. Thank you, Jamie. Please sit down if you'd like. This is a really long sermon, so. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone's looking forward to the final song. <laughs> okay. Three years ago this summer, I delivered my first sermon, Home is Where We Start From, as a worship associate from this podium. The home I was referring to is our home planet, and the sermon was one of a series that focused on the sources from which Unitarian Universalism draws. Number six, the spiritual teachings of the Earth-centered religions, my source, celebrates the sacred circle of life and instructs us to live in harmony with the rhythms of nature. As I mentioned three years ago, the sixth source speaks to me in a very direct and personal way. My grandfather and his family traveled to Nebraska around 1892 in a covered wagon from Kansas where he'd been born. Whenever my grandfather told the story of their journey north, he always mentioned that his, their team of horses was, uh, were named uh, Blackie and Coley. So I feel like I have to include it in the story here. Um, two years after they arrived, June 20th, 1894, my grandfather's father, William Madison Stilwell, died at the age of 43. The local newspaper, the Valentine Republican, gave a long account about my great-grandfather's death. Here is an excerpt. Mr. Stilwell had been sick several months and received careful medical aid by our home physicians, 
but he did not improve and was taken to a manual hospital in Omaha where it was hoped he would find permanent relief. But all that, but all that human kindness and medical skill could do was not sufficient to prevent death from claiming its victim. Mr. Stilwell, who is highly respected and honored by all who know him, leaves his wife and six children to mourn his death. I can't imagine what it was like uh, in 1894 to be a widow with six children. Lily Augusta, my great-grandmother, married quickly again to Cap Archer. He'd fought in the Civil War. His given name was Lewis, but I didn't find that out until maybe 10 years ago when Anna and I, my daughter, we were wandering around the cemetery and, and uh, ran across a grave, Cap Lewis Archer. Well, as you know, war is a traumatic event for many soldiers, and I think it was for Captain Archer. He was not, by all reports, a kind man. Two of the older children ran away within the first year or two. By the time my grandfather was 16, he was the town's teenage drunk. A family from the Pine Ridge Reservation picked him up from the streets of Valentine and brought him to their home to sober him up and to help heal him. He stayed with them the full year and went back for some long periods of time until he married. He often said the Pine Ridge family saved his life. One of the main benefits to me of his work as a custodian of a, an apartment house in Omaha where I grew up was that I got to tag along with him as he repaired window sashes and took care of the lawn. He was a jack of all trades and a master carpenter. Uh, he was a tall and lean man. Those genes I didn't get. Um, as he worked, he taught me the world. He said that since all living things share the same home, the earth below and the sky above, we were all related, even those squirrels who chewed through the electrical wire on the back porch, the moles beneath the north lawn, even the water bugs by the washroom drain when it rained. Each spring, he repeated the story of the thunder beings who he likened to very old men who brought the new season. Thunder, he said, is one of the four powers, along with lightning, wind, and cloud, who serve the evening star in the creation of the world each year. Every Sunday afternoon after Mass, after Sunday dinner, after the dishes were washed and put away, my grandfather sang as he, typed, as he tapped out his own private service on the kitchen linoleum. I'm not sure how I learned this, but I knew he was praising the people who saved him and the spirit of the world in which we all live. So here I am, many years later, very, very grateful to be able to welcome you to our Summer of Truth and Reconciliation, offering services and events focusing on past and present inhabitants and on the land of the land on which we live, the home that we all start from. I'll talk a little bit more about the offerings and the events um, a little later. I'm sure you're familiar with the calendar of events, and if you're not, pick, please pick one up when you leave. It'll give you all you need to know about what's coming up over the next six weeks. But I wanted to take a minute first to thank all of you, the whole congregation, for making the summer program possible. In spring 2020, our Board of Trustees established, established a task force focusing on the steps that we might take to dismantle white supremacy, individually, collectively, and within our larger community. It was a congregational priority. Beloved Conversations Within was the task force's first major initiative. More than 40 members signed up for the semester-long program offered by Meadville Lombard's FAS Collaborative. The course focuses on internal work that each of us must do as we engage in deeper personal understanding of race and racism. A second cohort of 20 congregants enrolled the following semester. 20 congregants who completed the Within program began 
beloved conversations among last fall, 2020, and we just finished up a few weeks ago. The, our attendance was subsidized by the church and we are all deeply grateful for the opportunity. As the name suggests, among fo focuses on principles of institutional anti-racism and the tools we need to work toward change. Five months ago at our Sunday service, it was January 15th, you as a congregation commissioned the members of the Among group to get our house in order. We as a congregation are ready for change and in fact we learned from the survey of lay leaders and congre congregants that we conducted last year that work is already underway. Also revealed in the survey was a loud call for education. How do we do this work? How do we do it better? One of the big surprises to me was the desire for developing a land acknowledgement, recognizing that our church stands on ground that once belonged to the indigenous people. This summer of truth and reconciliation aims to begin to answer the request for education as well as providing our congregation with an opportunity for building right relationships with our native neighbors in the community. This, we trust, will lead to the creation of a meaningful congregational land acknowledgement. Is this a big job for a summer's work? I think it is, but then I look back over the last two years and all we did by email, Zoom, and live stream. So, for a house to stand, a, a strong foundation is necessary and it is with this in mind that we turn toward the land in which the roots of our land and the roots of our faith are anchored and also to the people from whom land was taken and to their descendants. This is faith work that can lead to profound personal growth and relationship with others. Our collective journey kicks off this afternoon with Roots of Injustice, Seeds of Change. Developed by the Friends Peace Team, the presentation lays the groundwork for understanding our past by understanding the legacy of the doctrine of discovery. As it affected us, colonializers and the indigenous people. The presentation is educational and sometimes the history is harsh to hear, but in the truth lies the foundation for building. The following five Sundays, and you'll see them listed on the calendar, will include sermons that offer perspectives in our, on our indigenous past, as well as work toward truth, reckoning, and healing. Next Sunday on the 10th, the director of the Center for the Great Plains Study, Margaret Jacobs, will speak. Her recent book, After 100 Winters, focuses on white settlement and steps toward the reconciliation that are taking place, some within our own state. On the 17th, the following Sunday, Lakota citizen Kevin Aberesk, a journalist and native activist, you may know him for his work with the, his recent work with the Peace Camp, will bring us up to date on the continuing work in our community to re, uh, resist erasure. Following that service, I urge you to stay for a short film. It's The Return of the Pawnees, uh, made by Mr. Aberesk and Dr. Jacobs, and it tells the steps that Linda and Roger Welsh went through as they moved to return land to the uh, Pawnee. In addition, well, future Sundays, although this is towards the end of the month, uh, let me mention them. Kia Bordner and native environmentalist Taylor Keene, as well as Becky Smith and Christine Davis, who will reprise their uh, sermon on Whereas, uh, the book by Lily Long Soldier and the largest mass execution on American soil on which the uh, book is based. So don't stop coming after the first two, keep, keep coming into August. In addition to Saturday, Sunday sermons, there'll be six events coming up that I don't think you're going to miss. I'll just mention a couple of them that are coming up in the next week or two. This Friday on the 9th, we'll be showing two films that offer us a view of what 
right relationship might look like. It's kind of an abstract term. Two Rivers tells the story of a change in a rural community in Washington State as they're coming together with their indigenous community. The following Friday, join us for Dawnland, which traces the beginning of Maine's statewide uh, journey toward truth and reconciliation with the Wabanaki Nation. Discussions will follow both films. We'll talk about what they did and what we might do. So check your calendars. Um, in August, powwow time at the Lincoln uh, Indian Center. This year it'll be held on Saturday the 6th. As far as I know, a time hasn't been set. It, it usually starts around four, but watch the e-blast. As soon as we know, we'll send out the news. Don't miss it. It's uh, a wonderful experience. It, but if you haven't been to a powwow before, Omaha elder Mike Wolf will be at the church the evening before. He'll talk about uh, powwow culture as well as the work of the Indian Center. So I hope you can attend. As an adult, I attended the August intertribal powwows on the Metro Community College campus where Frank taught and we lived. Watching my own kids dance and play reminded me of my summers as a child in the sand hills of Cherry County. Every July, we visited my grandmother family, and I learned settler history from her 12 brothers and sisters and their families. At summer's end, my mother and grandfather came to collect us in time for the August powwow held on the Valentine Fairgrounds. Each year, I begged to go early uh, in time for the grand entry. Like Jenna of our story, I loved the brum, brum, brum of the drum. And I also loved the horses. Sometimes Grandpa and I didn't get there till evening, and I'd miss the girls' jingle dance. It was also a favorite of mine. Grandpa was mainly interested in meeting another set of old men, as he called them, his friends or family who had adopted him. They'd huddled together in a circle and spoke a mixture of English and Lakota or D Dakota. I'm not sure what it was, but it was the same language of the songs that he sang Sunday afternoons. At some point, I'd feel my grandfather's <clears throat> warm hand gentle against the middle of my back, directing me to go out and play with the other kids. <clears throat> go, he'd say, sending me off to explore, to learn, to have fun. And then in the evening, we'd all gather together for the community circle dance. So for extra fun, if you're going to the powwow, bring your kids and grandkids. They'll have a good time. Our formal discussions toward land acknowledgement begin the first Sunday of August. That's the 7th in the afternoon, 1 to 3. If you'd like to see how other UU land acknowledgements read, and, and sometimes they'll include information on how they were developed, go to the resource guide. Uh, you can get to it on the front page of our um, website. And we have a whole list of um, land acknowledgements, more information about the speakers, children's books that you might want to read to your kids, uh, other books that you might read to yourselves. <laughs> Um, it's just loaded with resources, so I urge you to, to find it and use it. Uh, at, the first member, at the first meeting, we'll come together as uh, members and friends to brainstorm what we'd like our land acknowledgement to include. Uh, we probably will talk about how we want to promote right relationship and reconciliation and work out a process for writing it. Two weeks later, we'll get together on the 21st to see where we are. Maybe we'll be putting finishing touches on our land acknowledgement. Maybe we'll have more work to do. Um, the task seems straightforward and reasoned, and it is that. But when I found, um, when I did my own land acknowledgement for the land I grew up on, it became a, a real emotional undertaking, and I'm going to have a drink of tea. It's really resulted in a deeper relationship with my home place, not just the land itself, but also with my land's ancestors. 
The first record of exchange on the deed attested that the parcel of land where I spent my high school years was, quote, granted on September 10th, 1860 by the U.S. by President John Buchanan, and you can see his signature, and transferred by Secretary Leonard to Elizabeth Bursar as allowed by the Treaty of July 15th, 1830. My journey of discovery that began purely historical became increasingly personal. The farm I called home, I learned, was part of the Nemaha Half-Breed Reserve, where the mixed blood children of colonizers and the Odo, Missouri, the Omaha, the I was the Yankton and Santee Sioux, who were not accepted elsewhere, either in the white or the native community, could live in peace. Research led me to Elizabeth Bursar, a young Dakota woman who was 14, a year younger than I was when I moved to the land. I've been able to trace her marriage, the birth of her children, her second marriage, and her death at 63 years of age on Valentine's Day, 1910, on the Standing Rock Reservation. Elizabeth, who was known as Lizzie, and her daughter-in-law, Marcella, who was in difficult labor, along with her three-year-old grandson, David, set out for the midwife's home. The newspaper reports that they had traveled eight miles when the, woman, when the women saw they weren't going to outrun the blizzard. They unhitched the horses to find their way home and, quote, huddled down in the sleigh to wait for the storm to pass. They slept, the newspaper account ends, and they never woke. Recently, I visited their graves online at the Ch Church of the Assumption in South Dakota. Between two larger monuments of mother and grandmother, two carved tree trunks with small lambs at the base mark the graves of David and an unknown baby born in the sleigh at the height of the blizzard. This last May, I was invited to a potluck uh, a dinner with a small group of Odo, Missouri people who'd come back to Nebraska to their homeland at the invitation of Margaret Jacobs and Kevin Aberask. What a moving opportunity it was to talk to people who loved the land I had lived on. One of the men in a delegation was a relative of another allotment recipient, a friend of my Elizabeth, uh, who had just lived down the road uh, from her. Our land acknowledgement, of course, is collective, but there may be surprises and stories on the way, and I really hope there are. And I hope you will join us for this and for the many services and events as you're able to. And watch the e blasts for the time, and we'll also send out reminders uh, of the events that are coming. I believe my grandfather was right. We share the same home, the earth below, and the sky above. I think we're all related, even those squirrels, the moles, and the water bugs. We share the air and breathe a common breath. I also believe that the creation story told by the Oto Missouri tribe that Jamie uh, just read, and they occupied the land on which our church sits, offers such good advice. Let us make meaningful gestures of friendship so that in these acts, truth and reconciliation can begin. May it be so. Now what you've all been waiting for, please join us in singing. <laughs> please stand or be seated as you wish for building a new way, 1017.
is in these acts the Odo Missouri creation story ends. In these acts, everything will begin. Our summer program begins this afternoon and continues through Ju July and into August. May my words serve as a warm hand, gentle on your back, uh, urging you to go. As my grandfather would say, explore, learn, and have fun. Thank you. heard from the 